This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Prime Spark, the podcast that brings you conversations that inspire, celebrate, and empower women over 55. The second women's revolution is here, and it is time for us to fuel a spark that will ignite your way forward, illuminate your path, and reflect your gifts in the world. Now, here is your host for Prime Spark, Sarah Hart. Hi, and welcome to Prime Spark. I'm Sarah Hart, and I'm so happy you're here today. Prime Spark is designed for women over 55 or close, with a goal to have us all live our happiest, most successful, fulfilled lives now and in the future. The mission of Prime Spark is to change the way our society sees and treats older women. That's a big mission, which only means we all need to be involved and we need to get started now. And today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Alison Van Diglen, whose work I greatly admire. Alison Van Diglen is a journalist, moderator, and interviewer. She's a regular contributor to the BBC World Service and her, has contributed to the BBC TV shows Panorama and Click TV and the NBC tech show Press Here. Her reports have appeared on PRI's The World, NPR's KQED in San Francisco, and BBC Homepage, and The Huffington Post. Her interview series, Fresh Dialogues, features lively interviews with business leaders, inspiring women, and cultural icons, including Elon Musk, Julia Gillard, Padmashri Warrior, and Martin Sheen. She moderates events for the Commonwealth Club, KQED TV, the Computer History Museum, and UC Santa Cruz. She hails from Scotland and worked for consultants in London and Paris before moving to Silicon Valley in 1994. She has degrees from Cambridge University and Paisley University. Welcome, Alison. I'm so happy you're here today. Wonderful to join you, Sarah. So in getting started, let me ask you, do you experience getting older? And if you do, what is that experience? And if you don't, why do you think it is that you don't? Well, I definitely feel I'm getting older. Um, I'm not as sharp as I once was. I'm forgetting people's names more. And I have moments of questioning myself. But I'm also a glass is half full person. And I there are certain things about getting older that I love. That feeling of, I think it's around 50, where you just don't give a damn anymore. You don't really care what people think of you, you're not so self-conscious and um, you're not held back by expectations of other people. You are, you know who you are. And so I, I see it as, I see getting older as a positive thing. And um, I have made a point of nurturing friendships with people a lot older than me. I have a dear friend who is 96 and she's still writing books and publishing. And we have the most fascinating philosophical conversations. And I'm in my 50s, in my mid 50s. And from her perspective, I see myself through her eyes. And I think that's a good trick if you're feeling you're getting old. Mm-hmm. I have a friend who's in their 90s because she thinks I'm a spring chicken. <laughs> and that feels good. <laughs> Well, Alison, you are sort of a spring chicken. I mean, in this sense, I mean, I called it prime spark because we are in our prime. We have a whole adult lifetime ahead of us. We've gained those years. And so we can fully expect to live another 10, 30, 40. I don't think it's very long from now that that women will be able to expect they can live into the hundreds yeah, you know, if we stay healthy, we're just we're we're who we are now. It's a different time. So 
You are a spring chicken in many, many ways. And that's interesting because I have asked women that question for several years. And I get that answer. You know, that we are, there are aspects to getting older that we love. And one of them is sort of the sense of freedom. You know, I am who I am. You don't like it? Tough. Yep. So that's, that's very common and I love it. You have done amazing interviews with people. I love listening to you. Um, Of the interviews you've done recently, what are one or two of the ones that have most intrigued you? Well, the most recent one I've done is very timely, very topical. I recently interviewed for Fresh Dialogues, my podcast, and also for the BBC, um, a Ukrainian in Silicon Valley. He's a tech leader in Silicon Valley who employs a team of people in Ukraine. And I should say employed because last month when the war started, his team dispersed. Some of them were serving on the front lines. Some got a, got away to Poland, got away to safety. And some are holed up in, um, in basements still. And so I was able to get his perspective of being a Ukrainian right now. And this was such an emotional, such a, a dramatic interview that normally uh, for a BBC piece, I was live on the BBC on a show, a world service show called Business Matters. And normally I would pull out the, what we call the the clips or the, the gold, the nuggets of gold from a 45 minute interview. And I would send them off to London. But in this case, it all happened so fast. I had 45 minutes of raw audio And I just sent it to London and they picked out um, some of the the most dramatic pieces. And um, so that was that was a very um, that that felt very meaningful because I really felt I'm part of this worldwide team of journalists who are sharing insights and stories about what's really going on in Ukraine. So that felt very powerful. I've also done um, quite a few pieces on how the pandemic is impacting our mental health, uh, reports about met, about our, about doing telehealth, how a lot of people were not able to see therapists in person and how telehealth works, you know, doing what we're doing right now, Sarah, Zooming, and uh, the pros and cons of that. And um, also a piece on grieving because I, lo- I talk with quite a few psychologists and grieving uh, um, experts in grieving who are saying we're just at the tip of the iceberg. There is a whole pandemic under this pandemic of these these people and maybe some of your listeners who experienced a death in their family or close friends and they weren't able to have that closure of seeing their loved one or even attending a funeral in person. So um, it's very, I try to choose as a freelancer for the BBC and having my own podcast, I try to choose what's really interesting to me. I can explore my curiosity to the nth degree. And um, I try to create reports and interview people with an aim of serving the listener of you know, educating them or helping them feel that, hey, I'm not alone. I'm not the only person going through this. And I think that is, um, uh, can be a valuable thing for people. Oh, I um, I love listening to your interviews and just everything you said there. I've got about 25 questions, but I'm going to try not to ask them all at the same time. So um, have you spoken to that tech executive since that interview? That was a remarkable interview. Oh, thank you for listening. Yes, I have. And um, he's actually launched a campaign. I think it's called um, Support Ukraine Now. He's launched a website and he is he has action items. He's trying to encourage people to write to their representatives, their state and D.C. representatives to get um, Joe Biden to do what he and his team think is necessary to. keep you know Putin at bay and save lives in his um, hometown and his 
his uh, country. Nice. So uh, I think it's called Support Ukraine Now. I can I can send you the link. Um, yeah, that would be. You can put it up later. Be. But he's he is he's become he's gone from being a Silicon Valley tech executive to being uh, an activist for um, helping Zelensky and um, helping the resistance to the the Russian invasion going on right now. Do you? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't want to get clear into the Ukraine here because this is an endless topic. Uh, but can you say briefly what he thinks we should be doing that we're not doing when you said he, uh, to try to get to write letters to get people to that? What is he what what would he like us to be doing? That we're not well, doing? one of the things and it, I think it is controversial. He is saying um, Ukraine needs fighter aircraft and he describes them as for defense you know to stop the the carpet bombing that's going on of the cities but of course that is controversial because if it's seen by putin as a nato effort back by the us or any of the nato countries then you know that could trigger putin into you know a, a nuclear um conflict so it's um I encourage I encourage uh, listeners to to get informed and um, and read about it. But yes, it's it's he he as a Ukrainian and seeing his native city destroyed, he wants the U.S. to be not boots on the ground, but to be more giving of more than just drones and more than what they're they're giving so far. Right. But as I say, I'm not necessarily condoning that. I. Well, let's leave it there. Maybe there are there are so many sides to this. It's um, mm -hmm. it's very complex. It's, it's very very, very, complex. It's very it's very complex. And the other point he made is, I I often ask my interviewees, what would you say if you could have um, five minutes with their president? In this case, I asked him, what would you do? What would you say to Putin if you could have two minutes with Putin? And he almost laughed in my face. He said, he's a madman. There, there's no rationality there there's no negotiating with a madman that's his point of view i think others others uh, feel differently and i know um diplomatic efforts are still underway and uh, i'm hopeful that um there can be a way of putin saving face and yet backing out of ukraine and it looks like we're moving in that direction he's focused on the donbass area so i'm hoping that um we can there's some way of ending the continual bloodshed every day. Well, me too. I I don't I don't see a way out, but um, the only way out that it seems to me that's possible that is short of just disastrous is negotiation and somehow. So we need to keep doing it. So, Alice, I'm really curious. I mean, you talked about um, the Ukraine. You talked about the pandemic, and you, and um, not all, but a lot of your um, interviews have to do with really significant things that are going on. And our world right now isn't full of a lot of significant things going on that are in the news. There are a lot of good, significant things going on, but they're not in the news as a generalization. So how how do you stay upbeat? You say you have a half glass full view, and I do too, and have been accused of Pollyanna sometimes, but you're in the thick of it in these interviews. How do you, I mean, on the interviews that I've heard you, you're very serious, but you're also upbeat. How do you, how do you stay that way? Well, I think I'm very fortunate that I'm kind of wired that way. My mom is a big optimist still she's almost 90 and um so i think i i think part of it is your dna but i think we can all no matter how we're wired i think we can focus on the positive without as you say being paula annie ish and um you know i think it was uh, mr rogers that always said you know when a disaster happens like 9 11 you know, it's just horrifying to watch with your kids, for example. But he taught us, taught us all, adults and kids alike, focus on the emergency workers, focus on the heroes. And I think no matter what's going on, I mean, you can look at Ukraine and you can just want to cry for the rest of the day, 
Or you can look at all these countries like Poland that have opened their doors and all these emergency workers who are stepping up and the heroism of Zelensky and all his team. So I think it's being mindful of the heroes that are out there and also to avoid that feeling of like, what can I do as a human being? Focus on what you can do in your local community because, you know, we can't all impact what's going on in Ukraine, but we can impact our immediate families, our friends, and, you know, give back to the community. Um, another tip I would say is a media diet. When, you know, I, I watch PBS News Hour every night and I keep up with the BBC News, but I, you know, as a journalist, it's kind of ironic. I have to put myself on a media diet when something like Ukraine is going on. As soon as it says, you know, some of these images may be disturbing, I'll fast forward. I don't want to have these images of suffering women and children, especially in my head. And I think you can still sit, stay um, well informed, but um, you don't have to look at all the images. You can read the stories. Um, and, and the other thing that keeps me optimistic is I have two young adult children and I am so full of optimism for their future and their um, connection with the environment and their hard work and their idealism. And that keeps me positive. So. Me too. I just want that generation to get in there now and start doing what they're going to be doing, because I have great hope and faith in what they're going to do. And we need them. A lot of them are doing things now. You know, it's not like they haven't started, but at some point they're going to be more directly involved in making some of the big decisions and directions. And I, I'm looking forward to that time because I think it's going to be up to them. So I like thinking of the heroes. And when I think of um, when you were talking about the pandemic, there were certainly a lot of heroes in that. I mean, if I think of the healthcare workers, I mean, those, they were amazing heroes. All of, all of the healthcare workers were amazing. So that's really, that's a good tip because I find myself avoiding news. I always was up to date on news. You know, I wouldn't say a news junkie, but I always was, up, and I'm not now nearly as much as I was because I just can't, I can't do it. I, you know, there's just a certain point and okay, that's it. Um, so I think you do have to pick and choose. So in addition to these wonderful interviews that you're doing, Allison, um, what else are you doing now? that is most interesting, exciting for you? Well, I would go back to uh, my children. I actually have my son visiting right now and his, his girlfriend is a healthcare worker. She's been in the ICU wards all through the pandemic. Uh, she's a traveling nurse and that just gives me hope talking to the young people and seeing you know, my, my son, for example, he's an entrepreneur. He is riding this wave of pent up demand for parties, for weddings. Um, he has his own business, the Fire DJs in Portland, Oregon. And I'm just thrilled to see how he is putting his talent and expertise and bringing joy to people. And um, our daughter, too, she is working. She just embarked on a five year PhD program, society program in Palo Alto, Stanford. And just seeing, you know, seeing her fairly regularly because she's close by now is is just such a joy. And to again, to keep positive, to imagine the impact that these young people are going to have in the future. Um, when I'm dead and buried, I, that gives me a lot of optimism. And I think that's a, a good trick for listeners to, you know, when they're feeling, because, you know, I think we all have days where we're like, oh, my goodness, it's just one thing after another. I feel like we didn't get a breather between the pandemic tailing off and then the war starting. But when we do have days like this, I think focusing on the young people in your life, whether they're your kids or other people's kids, nieces and nephews, I think that's that's a wonderful thing to do. And, um, and I, looking ahead, one day I would love to write a book, um, a distillation of wisdom of all these amazing people that I've interviewed. Um, people like Julia Gillard, she was the first prime minister of Australia 
And uh, she's famous for that, of course, but she is also famous for what's called the misogyny speech. And she was attacked, verbally attacked in Australian Parliament, and she just snapped. And she got back at her male colleagues who were using very derogatory terms to describe her and um, implying that she was a loose woman, all this kind of stuff that you thought, you know, we left behind in the Victorian era. And I highly recommend you, you Google Julia Gillard misogyny speech because her speech is so articulate and so enthusiastic. She has inspired millions of women who've watched this to speak out when they experience misogyny or put downs are not allowed to have their voice heard in a room full of guys. And this is for women, especially in that field where they're in the minority, you know, you may be the only woman at the table. So um, that kind of thing inspires me. The idea of distilling this kind of wisdom is like, how did she get the courage to speak out like that, you know? And um, I'm fascinated by psychology too. And um, I think using some of the psychology that I've learned through my interviews, I think that could be a very interesting and kind of action oriented book for, for people to, to read and learn from and be inspired from. Bye. I want to order it right now. So um, <laughs> you have to write it soon because I... <laughs> Yeah, that will be really, that will be fun to read. That's interesting when you say, um, I'm going to look that speech up. I want that speech. Um, it, it's almost like there are times that I think we just get to the, the end and think, that's it. That's it. No more. And it sounds like that's what happened for her. Because I think that, so. would, I asked that would her be a huge risk that. on her part. And it was almost like, I mean, from the way you describe it, I, I haven't read it, but from the way you describe it, it's almost like she didn't even think about what she was doing. She didn't exactly have a choice. She just had to act right then. That was it. No more. Yes, I think so. She had not prepared this, but I think in all the abuse that she'd suffered, she had internalized it. And I think the speech was just ready to go. She's one of these people that's very, very articulate. And um, yeah, it's, you, you can help cheering her. It, it, will, um, it will inspire anyone who watches it. Have you felt that? In, in, I mean, as a journalist, have you felt either sexism or ageism or gendered ageism or anything in your work? Because you're in a field that you could. Yes, I, I have to say I haven't. Um, I, I have experienced a time as a freelancer. And this I wouldn't say it's necessarily sexism, but I've had a door closed in my face as a journalist. And any journalist listening, they'll know this expression. It's called a kill fee. And um, after you get an assignment for a written, or in my case, it was a radio piece, the door was closed in my face. I worked with a new editor and she just didn't like what I was doing. I had uh, done a piece and it was about Chinese entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And I'd interviewed all these young 20 something entrepreneurs and told them, you're going to be on national public radio. So they'd given up their precious time. And, you know, for startup leaders, this is, you know, it really was precious time. And um, this editor had me rewrite it two or three times and finally said, no, I'm going to give you a kill fee. And so the door was slammed in my face and I was devastated, not so much for the work I had put into this piece, but for the, all these young entrepreneurs, I didn't want to let them down. And so in this case, what I did was I decided, OK, I'm going to find a home for this story. This was actually a piece for PRI, the world. And um I got the kill fee from them and I started emailing and messaging everyone I could think of, you know, KQED, everyone. And I actually wrote to the Facebook page of the BBC World Service and I told them I'd interviewed Elon Musk and I've got this great story and it's all about Chinese entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and here's why it's great. 
And that actually, it was a it was a case of, you know, my mother's mantra, one door closes, another opens. I, I didn't accept the door closing. I decided, okay, I'm going to batter down a door until one opens. And that actually opened this amazing career I'm now in, working for the BBC. And I think I've contributed to over half a dozen different programs on the BBC as a result of that. So my my takeaway there is, you know, even if you do experience sexism or, you know, doors closing, sometimes, um, you know, you got to push back on that person, you know, if it is a true sexist comment or an ageist comment. But sometimes the answer, it, you can you can re package it or reframe it as a gift and say, okay, I'm going to find someone else to work with, you know, if you're really not being appreciated somewhere. Um, so anyway, that was, um, that was my story. And um, I tell my kids that story and any young person who will listen, because I think it's an important one to realize that um, sometimes you've got to go around the mountain, you know, find another open door. That's interesting because that is almost an example also of running into no and deciding, no, that's no, I'm not going to take that. No, that's that's not what I'm going to do. So good for you, Allison. So in addition to the book, which I I encourage you to write and I can't wait until it comes out whenever that is. um, What other dreams do you have for what may be next or next or next that you haven't yet realized? Well, I wish Nelson Mandela were still alive. He was on my want to interview list and um, uh, I missed that opportunity. Um, I would love to interview Michelle Obama, Barack Obama. And I also one day I would love to write a novel. Um, I was very inspired by Douglas Stewart's Shuggy Bain which is a novel set in my hometown of Glasgow. And um, like that novel, I would like to explore the underbelly of Scotland. A lot of people think about Scotland and it's all, you know, tartan and whiskey and beauty. And it is all that, but there's also an underbelly I would love to explore. There, um, The class system is still, or when I was growing up in a way, it was still very powerful there. Religious wars, the plight of the unions, public housing, gangs, violence. I could write about all these things from some of it firsthand experience. And um, also, again, going back to this mental health aspect, when I was growing up, there was a very closed attitude to mental health. And I would love to write about mental health in Scotland as it was when I was a kid there and as it is today and um, how enlightened a lot of the West Coast of the United States is and and try and help that movement. I think we're moving in that direction in Scotland and in Europe in general about getting rid of the stigma of mental health. But I think I would love to um, help accelerate that movement so that, you know, if you're seeing a therapist, it's not a big deal. And um, I've used the opportunity on live BBC World Service um, contributions. You know, I'm on a show which is live for a whole hour and the conversation can go in any direction and any opportunity I have. I've talked about the fact that, you know, I sometimes see a therapist and it's not a stigma and it's, it's such a positive. It's like going to see a physical therapist if you break your knee. There are times when uh, a psychologist can really help you address things and sweeping traumas under the carpet is not a good idea. That reminds me, I, I don't remember how long ago this was or who I said it to, but I remember saying to somebody at one point, I don't know that I've known any adult worth knowing who hasn't seen a therapist at one point or another. <laughs> so, yes, I love that. I yeah. love that. And I, think I think it's it- true. I mean, we all have our stuff growing up and, and then the sooner we can get rid of some of it, the more ha- successful all of, in all ways will be. So that's interesting, Alison, because you can write a novel in such a way that um, it's a novel, you know, it's a novel. I, I, I just finished reading The State of Terror by Hillary Clinton and um, Louise Penny. And I was fascinated by it because I thought Hillary Clinton could include a lot of stuff in here that she might not have been able to include any other way because this is a novel. You know, so you can you can do a lot in a novel. So, yes, that's so true. Very yeah. true. 
When you leave this earth, you talk about being dead and buried and your children doing wonderful things. What do you most hope to be remembered for? Well, like I said, um, I can't say enough good things about my kids. I think I will be remembered as the, as the mother of Lewis and Tanera. Um, and also, I think, as the strong woman behind my husband's success, he's a GPS, you know, written the book on GPS. So um, I like to think I've, you know, helped contribute to that as, you know, behind the scenes. And also, um, people have commented on uh, my interview with Elon Musk um, as the person who helped humanize Elon Musk because I think I interviewed him almost 10 years ago but a lot of people have said it's a timeless interview because it's really about the man not the bravado sharp talking kind of hard talking businessman it's really about Elon Musk and his his humanity his humility his quirky sense of humor his emotion he he actually um came close to crying three times with me and um, I think because I, I really tapped in, he opened up. People tend to open up to me. So um, I, I like to think that, you know, I think Elon Musk gets a lot of bad rap. I mean, he, he, he's a rule breaker. He takes on the establishment and that's how he has succeeded as an entrepreneur. But I think um, a lot of people think, oh, he's just that. He's just a rule breaker and you know, makes his his team work really, really hard. And I think that that's all true. But I think there is a softer side to Elon Musk. And um, I'm kind of proud of that interview that he he revealed that. And some of his inner circle gave me feedback on that interview and said, you really showed the, showed the world the, the real Elon Musk that they know and love. And um, so I'm kind of proud of that one. It would be fun for you to do one with him now. And see yes. the difference in the passage of time. You know, as you're as you're describing him, um, I don't know if if this is accurate at all, but it, there, I felt as if some similarities between him and Steve Jobs. And um, I don't know if anybody's made that comparison. They probably have, but I hadn't actually thought of it before. Um, yes, he actually. I talked to him during the interview about Steve Jobs, and he said that. Steve Jobs was very rude to him, super rude to him. He didn't go into specifics. He was too much of a gentleman. But he said it wasn't like I went up and was hanging on to him. He was intro introduced to Steve Jobs by Larry Page, you know, of Google. <laughs> and, and still Steve Jobs snubbed him. So um, I think they're very different people. Yeah. But let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Now there, um, I guess as you're describing things about um, – Elon Musk. I mean, those kinds of things have been said about Steve Jobs and, and the opposite have been said about him, too. I mean, so interesting, interesting. We are complex beings, that's for sure. So thank you so much, Allison. This has been delightful. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do that? Yeah, so I'd invite them to uh, either go to freshdialogues.com and uh, use the contact tab and write to me there. Or even better, just connect with me on LinkedIn, Alison Van Diggelen. Great, thank you. So that's our time today. Please join me again. You can find our Prime Spark podcasts on every major outlet. Find out more about Prime Spark at www.primesparkwomen.com. Thank you so much to my guest, Alison Van Diglen. You can contact her on freshdialogues.com or on LinkedIn. So thank you for being with us. Take care. Spread tolerance and love. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on Prime Spark. With each episode, Sarah Hart brings you conversations that inspire, celebrate, and empower women over 55. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes about remarkable, experienced women, go to EWNpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available at Spotify, Apple Podcast, and most other major podcast sites. The second women's revolution is here, and we hope that you use the insights you've gained here to fuel the spark that will ignite your way forward 
illuminate your path, and reflect your gifts in the world. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is it so hard to make a buck? <laughs> I know I have. Hi, I'm Sandra Yancey, founder and CEO of eWomen Network. What I have discovered after going from the brink of bankruptcy to running a multi-million dollar award-winning business is this. You can't build a million dollar dream hanging around minimum wage mindsets. My mission is one million women entrepreneurs generating one million dollars in annual revenue. So here's what I've done. I've created the mother of all entrepreneur success programs that you can access online on your time. It's called Monetize Me Now. It's a seven module online course that is 100% my success formula, covering mindset, mission, management, motivation, marketing, and measure. Come on, take my hand and I'll show you the way to learn to earn flowing revenue for your business. Visit monetizemenow.com for details. Calling all speakers. eWomen Network has speaking engagements all over North America that must be filled. Are you a gifted messenger, author, expert, or successful entrepreneur that can help women entrepreneurs grow their businesses? Our mission is to help one million fulfilled women each achieve one million dollars in annual revenue. If you're a speaker that can help women prosper, go to eWomenNetwork.com and sign up as a pro member of our Speakers Network. That's eWomenNetwork.com. Thanks for listening. This is the EWN Podcast Network.